You're listening to the Connecting Industry podcast brought to you by Connecting Industry. You can find out more about the resource and construction industry, including how to communicate consciously with your stakeholders at connectingindustry.com.au. Welcome to the Connecting Industry Podcast, brought to you by Connecting Industry. I'm Kieran Moran. The Connecting Industry Podcast series is designed to tell the stories of the people who work in the resource and construction sector throughout Australia. It's our goal for these podcasts to not only keep you up to date with the latest resource and construction news, information and procurement opportunities, but most importantly, build relationships between you and our guests so you can connect with their stories and get a better understanding of how to communicate and tell your business story right. On this week's Connecting Industry Podcast, we have Sunshine Hydro Executive Chairman Michael Meyer. Michael is a serial entrepreneur with venture capital experience in startup ventures and sustainable development. He has a passionate interest in bringing engineering and economic resources to projects to support our social and environmental challenges. Sunshine Hydro are developing a super hydro project in the Gladstone region, a pumped hydro with green hydrogen project being developed in three stages. Stage one in Gladstone is a battery and electrolysers project. Stage two in Miriam Vale is a vanadium battery and electrolysers project. And stage three, the final stage, a pumped hydro and electrolysers project at Coliseum near Miriam Vale. Welcome to the program, Michael. Oh, Kieran, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Now, as you heard in that introduction, and I've got to start off this, uh, your bio, it actually starts off as a serial entrepreneur. I've got to know, what the hell is a serial entrepreneur? (laughs) Uh, I guess it means that... uh... I've, I've had a career of starting new businesses, new enterprises, both here and um, been involved in the United States for basically my whole of my professional life. I've done many things, just as, a, for example, the Brumbies Bakery chain. I started that, and listed it back in the day on the second board on the Sock Exchange and grew that into, you know, 100 stores. I was involved in Australia's uh, first high-tech float on NASDAQ uh, for a company based in San Francisco. Uh, I started Queensland's first uh, venture capital startup fund, which grew into a multi-billion dollar fund. So, yeah, I've done a lot of things and started a lot of businesses. <laughs> and what, what inspires you there to do that? Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a not, not an easy thing and you have to be, you know, as we all know in business, you have to be extremely motivated to get there, but you're seeing oh. the, it's like a glint in your eye that makes you do these things and see this, the possibilities. What is that? Uh, well, for my sins, Kieran, I think I, I'm willing to, you know, take risks. I, I like to do things that bring about change, uh, are transformative. I, I guess I inherited it from my grandfather, Sidney Meyer, who started the Meyer department store chain. He, he was the same. So I think I inherited his DNA. And it, that's both a strength and a weakness. Yeah, it can be, can't it? And uh, as you said, it started the Meyer change. And so that's, uh, I was trying to think of uh, the word there. It's uh, something to either live up to or it's an over bearing shadow of the family as well and of course it's a very successful chain okay then so you take risks and that's you know that's what it is all about so what makes you take those risks what makes you what makes you believe in yourself like you do it's a very interesting question i guess the thing about being an entrepreneur or in in venture capitalist is 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 the willingness to take risks and to to understand the connection between, you know, risk and reward. And in that sense, reward is both, you know, financial reward, but equally it's, it's, it's emotional and spiritual reward from, from creating something. You know, there's this great satisfaction that comes from seeing something that people haven't seen before and trying to bring it to reality. And I guess that's as much what drives an entrepreneur as is the financial rewards, you know. Uh, and with taking risk is also, you know, taking entrepreneurial risk is, is the risk, you know. It's starting a new business of any kind. Um, it keeps you awake at night. 
Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it does. Actually, that's. Uh, I'll, I'll go. Uh, why not? I might as well ask that question now. And I wasn't planning to ask, but as you said, it keeps you awake at night. That's one question that I actually ask quite a lot of CEOs and so forth, and it's one of my leading questions when I go to a lot of networking events. So uh, what's keeping you awake at night? And uh, a lot of um, answers in relation to that, but it's always good to get that, uh, you know, it's, it's a great way to start a conversation. But um, with keeping awake at night, what makes you, how do you manage to go back to sleep? <laughs> Sometimes I don't. <laughs> I'm sure you don't. <laughs> Some people have blackboards. Uh, because I started pads. the Brumbies, for example, but because I started the Brumbies Baker Trade, I actually baked for a couple of years and I loved it because you'd get up at two or three in the morning and it was a really peaceful, quiet time of the day and you'd be working with your hands and that was in itself was satisfying. But having having created a habit, you know, being able to wake early in the morning and be very productive, sometimes I do wake and you can ask my wife, at, you know, quite early in the morning. And I actually get a lot of my clearest thinking uh, done very early in the morning, you know. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes I wake up with an idea or uh, a new thought or a new, a new paradigm to reflect on and, and I don't go back to sleep, you know. And it, it leads to certain actions and certain outcomes that often propel the business, you know, forward. So I, I find that the early hours in the morning um, actually some of my most productive hours. Um, yeah, so I... it, it, can, it can be a source of stress. Like, for example, you can wake up when you're growing a business and one of the things that you know, people would say to you is you go, well, how, how the hell am I going to make payroll <laughs> for the next week? You know, how, how am I going to you know, meet the commitments to the people who I've taken responsibility on? for employing them. So it, it can have that that creation of that anxiety, which also is motivating, you know, or you've taken on debt and you say, well, how am I going to, you know, repay that debt? All of these things tend to focus the mind. Right? And personally, I, I actually do find sometimes the early morning is a, is, is a time where you can be very focused in your mind. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. I'm uh, an early riser as it is, and uh, many times I've been working at uh, 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. as well, and people always ask, what the hell? You send an email to me at that time in the morning, but uh, yeah, it's when I get my best work done and you haven't got those interruptions. Now, you did mention your wife there. Now, as the saying, what's that saying that they say behind every good man is the woman, of course, because uh, for me myself, um, I don't think I'd be in business without my wife. The support structure that you've got behind you to be able to do what you've done, like you, like you said, you've, uh, you know, with the Brumbies chain and so forth, and um, you've managed into uh, with the uh, Maya company as well, um, with the investment, if I've got that right, with the investment fa- founding investment fund or so that you did there. I probably got that slightly wrong. I do apologise. Oh uh, so, yeah, it was it was I set up a venture capital fund. I won one of the what was called the Double AI license, oh, innovation yes, yep. investment fund licenses. About twenty, it was about nineteen ninety eight. Yep, and so we we made a competitive tender and won the Queensland one. Um, so there was five licenses originally issued under the LNP government, and we won the only Queensland one. Okay, I'll go back to that question. So, how does your wife put up with you? Uh, <laughs> well, sometimes she doesn't. You know, she she, she says, uh, you know, how why are you working this hard at your age? You know, I'm I'm in my seventies now. And it's, like I said, it's just a part of my DNA of, of who I am. You know, I, I like to start new things and I find it very energising. And I think, it, I think it does keep you young. Um, you know, look at a lot of successful entrepreneurs. It's the thing that gets them going. Uh, there's a Japanese term, I don't know whether you've heard of it. It's called ikigai, you know, and ikigai is this concept of, you know, what is it that energizes you and motivates you to get up and, and, and animates your being and causes you to focus, you know. So I guess starting new businesses, uh, particularly today in the clean energy space, is my icky guy. Yeah, it's, uh, um, again, I'll have to, uh, you know, agree with you there. And I've always said it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, there's always new possibilities and new opportunities. It's just a matter of yeah, being energized to be able to go and do it. So, um 
you know, I don't think I myself will ever retire. Uh, don't know if I'll be working in my 70s, but God, I bloody hope so. Okay, let's just um, move in. So, of course, Brumbies was in the 80s and so forth, and uh, you've already said how old you are. It's one thing I try not to give away on our podcast, just to be polite in that respect. Most people can figure it out in the end. But, um, and of course, um, so you're director of the Meyer Family Company up to around about uh, 2000 or so, and that was from 85 to 2000. So a lot of entrepreneurial work that you did there, and, well, you've done it all through your career. Before we get into the Sunshine Hydro project, which is based about around the region of Gladstone in Queensland, of course, uh, you also did a little bit of other work. And as you said before, in relation to you know um, the environment uh, is another area, and sustainability is another area that motivates you. And um, you were involved in the uh, Sunrise at 1770, which is uh, basically the first conservation sustainable village that was uh, built in Australia, if I could get that correct. Yeah, that's right. So I I did that project 24 years ago, but I'd been holidaying in the region out at Agnes Water, which, as you know, is south of Gladstone for many years before that. And one of my best friends from school rang me when I was living in San Francisco in the early 90s and said that he'd bought a piece of land on the Queensland coast and I knew that he knew every inch of the Queensland coast and I knew that if he'd bought a piece of land, it'd be an exceptional piece of land. And I ended up buying a lot from him. He did a seven lot subdivision over the phone. So I ended up building a house there south of Agnes on the beach, looking out over the uh, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, um, happily you know, my kids grew up there and surfed and played on the reef and fell in love with the area. But I'd noticed that there was this adjoining piece of land where people would camp and the four-wheel drivers would drive on the beach and BHP had a sign for BHP minerals on the land and it was for uh, mineral exploration, so sand mining. And then in the late 1990s, BHP said they're going to rationalise some of their properties and I made inquiries and found out that it wasn't uh, simply a leasehold, a mining lease, it actually they had the freehold. So I went and negotiated the purchase of that land from BHP um, and bought it uh, with the view to doing a sustainable village development. But in order to do that, I knew I'd have to get rid of the sand mining leases. So I came up with a concept that was unique globally and... I actually ended up going to the Premier and saying, this is what I want to do there. It's going to be groundbreaking. Um, would he consider sterilising the sand mining leases? And they actually, the government came down on my favour and said they would. So they agreed to sterilise the sand mining leases, which I acquired from BHP as well as the land. And so there were 90 kilometres of the Queensland coast over which there were sand mining leases. And they were sterilised. It was the only second time in the Queensland history that that had happened. So that enabled me to go on and do the, the village, Sunrise at 1770, that went on and won the award for the best sustainable development in Queensland and then the best sustainable development in Australia. And then I put it up for the international awards for the FBICA and it won the silver medal. So it's a bit like the FBI say is like the um, Property Development Olympics. So I was uh, second on the podium that year. That was 2008. And, yeah, it, it was a very unique development. It was very successful. It broke a lot of uh, ground on technological solutions and conservation. I gave 80% of the land to Bush Heritage and became the Rudy Creek, Creek Reserve. So I've been working in the Gladstone area and, and recreating in the area since the early 90s um, so yeah uh, we, we i have you know. um i have a few friends of course who stayed down there on that estate as well myself now and then um when we go down and a few friends do have houses down there and it's um uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful spot um that you have developed there and uh you know we i can go through a little bit more of your history of course as we move forward but was that the start of you looking at 
you know, conservation type of projects. So of course, we've got the uh, Sunshine Hydro now, and um, we'll get into that in a minute. Mm. But no, no, it goes back further than that, Kieran. Um, okay. I, I guess I drew a lot of inspiration from my father. This was a, a passion and a love that he had. He he was a great believer in sort of reforestation and the protection of the environment, and I drew inspiration from him. So it's a bit of a backstory. He and the architect, Sir Roy Grounds, found a piece of land down the south coast of New South Wales, and it had been sort of forested and that had been cut for timber. And they ended up buying this piece of land, uh, which has now become a national park after his death and became a part of one of New South Wales national parks. But they bought the forest. Uh, they both built beautiful homes uh, on, the, on the site. They restored the forest. And that inspired me, what they did. You know, I sort of learned from Saroy Grounds the sort of things he did. He built the first sort of really small scale wind turbine on the headland there. And then he had solar to to power his own house. So I guess I had sort of mentors in, in the form of my own father and uh, Sir Roy Grounds. And it's just been always a, a passion of mine that development should go hand in hand with conservation and biodiversity outcomes. It's been going for a number of years now in relation to conservation and so forth, and the renewable energy sector has moved a lot more forward over the last few years in Australia. Large scale, that uh, the point is there really to that respect. How have you seen things? So when you were, were starting to do that early, and even your father, you can go back to your father there, as you just said. What have you seen, like, if we can go back to, like, even, like, uh, Tasmania, if we started to think about Tasmania in the 80s with the Franklin and so forth and uh, the uh, movement that happened there with the environmental sector and protecting that land and, and, and making it heritage listed and so forth, how have you seen, you, you've been sort of at the forefront and seen some of the changes and the attitudes change across Australia, both politically um, also um, uh, commercially and also within the community and, you know, fundamentally within the media. How have you seen and taken on those sort of changes over the last 20 years? Oh, gee. It's a really big question, Kieran. The, the The thing about, if you like, Australia's... If you look back over the last 25 years, I mean, Australia has been driven by its success in particular in in the mining industry and agriculture and that's especially true for Queensland they're fundamental drivers of Queensland's economic success <clears throat> the coal industry obviously out of Gladstone and things like that the thing that you'd have to say is the the principles of sustainability of conservation, of the clean energy transition haven't really been top of mind in that development. <clears throat> it's really been about how do we exploit the natural resources that are there? Mm. And that, I think, has not been reflective of what could have been best practice. Okay. And I think... I think that that also then goes to, you know, our relationship with our First Nations partners in the development of our economy, you know, that often they've been thought of sort of after the event and not been embraced as full equity stakeholders in the exploitation and the development of those resources. Yeah, it's one thing I like to say so, is, is, is um, a lot of people <clears throat> like to tick the box, but doesn't mean anything. Yeah, so there is. There's a lot of, you know, in getting projects approved, it's about, you know, speed to market, going through the, 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 the box ticking exercise. And today, I guess there's, a, you know, a lot of greenwashing around projects too, you know, putting mm -hmm. a green tint on those projects. Yep. So I think that, you know, Australia as a whole, we've been extraordinarily successful and we've benefited enormously from the, since the mid-90s, the transformation of the Chinese economy and, and that's flowed through into 
every Australian has benefited immeasurably. You know, our national wealth, uh, right down to individual levels, has has benefited from it. But you'd have to ask yourself the big question is, has our environment benefited or has it suffered? You know, has has the indicators around our biodiversity, around threatened species, around the amount of land clearing, you know, on the, you know, the pollution of our rivers, uh, the degradation of the Great Barrier Marine Park, on all those other environment indicators, the scorecard is not so good. <laughs> And our relationship with our First Nations uh, brothers and sisters is also nowhere near where it could be. So from where I sit in terms of environmental outcomes, in terms of uh, First Nations outcomes, in terms of social justice, the scorecard is, is not looking all that, all that positive, put it that way. Yeah, so we've got a uh, um, no, no, great answer there, Michael. It's um, uh, you know I think you, you've hit the nail on the head. Got a long way to go. We have improved, but uh, still got a long way to go. And it's yeah, it's not about uh, it's about real pass- uh, participation rather than just uh, ticking those boxes, which we have talked a bit, little bit about on this podcast for the last few years, and uh, watching a, you know a lot of companies do that. But does it really matter? Um, to them in the long run and is it actually is there actually benefits that um, apply to some of those projects so let's get on to the project of course so uh, Sunshine Hydro that's uh, the company that you're basically the executive chairman of tell us a little bit about Sunshine Hydro and then also the main project now I'd love to uh, pronounce that project properly <laughs> in that respect uh, but the super Jan- Jandori Gumi Jandori Gungi, which means spirit in the water, or the you know the energy or the good karma that flows in the water. Okay, so tell tell us a little bit about Sunshine Hydro, but also these projects. And as we have, we have you uh, presenting at a Connected Industry Luncheon in another couple of weeks' time, and you'll be talking about this project as well. Give mm. us a little bit of a rundown. I met Chris Baker, who was the founder of Sunshine Hydro, back in late 2018. Uh, I met him uh, on the political campaign at the time. I was thinking of standing against the uh, current leader of the opposition in the in his seat. I didn't win the pre-selection, which my wife was very happy with, but I got to meet Chris. Chris is an engineer and a software engineer, and he developed a, a model of looking at how you solve the problem of providing firm green energy when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Mm. And it developed a software tool that fundamentally thinks about deep energy storage in the form of pump hydro. And I was really taken with his software model. I was already taken with what it could do in the clean energy transition in Australia. So uh, I asked him whether he wanted some help in developing the company. And he said, Yes, he did, and uh, I agreed to join him back in 2019, so it's nearly um, five years that I've been working in the company. In that time, we've developed a portfolio of projects uh, in Australia. Uh, We now have uh, some prospective projects in New Zealand as well, and the, the flagship project that we've been working on very intensely over these past three or four years is a project south of Gladson. It's called, as I said earlier, Jandori Gungi. It was the name given to it by the traditional owners, in particular Dr. Kerry Blackman, who's the head of Gadarjil, and I've known Kerry for 25 years. So that project is, it is what we now call a super hybrid project. So what it does is it integrates Uh, wind and solar, which we would source under PPA from third-party developers with a pump hydro project. And then it's also integrated with the production of green hydrogen through electrolysis. And now uh, using that hydrogen combined with biomass to produce green fuels. So we're looking for offtake in the 
green fuels industry and especially in the uh, shipping industry and the aviation industry. And we've optioned the land in and around uh, Miriam Vale for the project. We've done the master planning. We're in the planning process with the council and the state government. We're in discussions with off takers for the carbon free energy we're producing and also the green fuels. So it is a very big project. It's a it's an ambitious project. It, the nameplate size of it is 600 megawatts of pumped hydro, uh, 300 megawatts of electrolysis, and a couple of hundred thousand tons per annum of uh, green fuels production. So it's a very ambitious project, and we're working with partners on it. And one of those parts is we're looking to do a mini version of the same at the Port of Gladstone in partnership with the university, Central Queensland University. Uh, we call it a mini super hybrid. So instead of pumped hydro, Kieran, we're looking to use uh, flow batteries as the deep energy storage uh, medium. So it's, it is, as I said, it's an ambitious project in uh, scale. It's an ambitious project in terms of vision and it's innovative in the way it brings all of these different infrastructure elements together into this concept of a super hybrid. It's like a seamless ecosystem. And what we end up getting out of the project is in the order of 350 megawatts of carbon-free energy, 24-7 carbon-free energy, uh, about 60 tonnes of hydrogen a day, about 10 times that amount in terms of methanol and even bigger scale because we'll be producing some of the methanol from biomass only. So, yeah, that's what I'm heavily involved in. Uh, we also have a project in northern New South Wales and we're working now very actively on a, a green fields project in the Rotorua area on the North Island of New Zealand. So that's a bit of the story of Sunshine Hydro. It definitely is uh, extremely ambitious, but um, I think you're a man of ambition in that respect. So, Michael, thank you very much for joining us today on the Connecting Industry podcast. Now, as I did say earlier, you will be presenting the project, pronounce the project again. I'll get it wrong all the time. The project. There we go. Yeah. You'll be presenting that project, three stages for that project as well within the Gladstone, Merriam Vale region. But uh, so at the Connecting Industry Lunch on, on August 28th. But uh, Michael, it has been fantastic and very interesting having you on the podcast. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Karen. Uh, thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Connecting Industry Podcast interview series with Kieran Moran from Connecting Industry. If you want to find out more about the resource and construction industry, including past podcasts, news and events, go to connectingindustry.com.au.